We're live. Alexa, 30 minute timer. 30 minutes. Starting. You get us going, kid. What's up, folks? Kevin here with uh, the Savage Podcast crew, my fellow co hosts, Harry Sandman, PR Vlogs, David, David Lucas, videos and collectibles. And today we're going to be discussing and reacting to chapters three and four of The Mandalorian. How are you guys doing today? Doing good, doing good. Ready to talk about these two exciting chapters of this. We're now halfway through the first season of this series exclusive to Disney Plus. Yeah. And we're a little behind on this only because of the holiday weekend. It kind of, we fell behind a bit, but we're ready to get picked back up where we left off and get everything going again. So uh, I'm pretty sure y'all feel the same way, but chapters three and four blew me away. I was very happy with one. We discussed that two had to be sl a little slow, but three and four were just amazing in my opinion. You know, they really blew me away. You have no complaints for these two chapters. They were both. I work uh, at my part-time job. I work with people that are not Star Wars fans at all. And, and they're the digging it. The vibe of the, the, that cowboy western, you know, space western vibe mm -hmm. from it is so strong that they fell in love with it. That's awesome. It's like watching an old Western movie, you know? So what you're telling me is you don't have to be a lifelong Star Wars geek who knows every ins and out of the entire saga in order to enjoy this show. Yeah, that's my opinion. I think this this uh, story stands alone. You don't need to have all the big backstory. Because if you watch uh, the Ma Mando himself, he doesn't seem like he has knowledge of the Force. He seems a little confused by it. And... They're starting fresh, you know, being post-Empire. So what you're saying is the Mandalorian, he's so relatable as a progatness in this show that anybody can come into this as a fan of spaghetti westerns or sci-fi or just good storytelling in general and enjoy this show whether they've watched every one of these movies or not, right? Yeah. And I have a whole new respect for John Farger and uh, oh, even that, what's her name, uh, Bryce Dallas. They, I think she they're, directed episode chapter four. Right. Yeah. I think they're doing just such a top-notch job. So very impressed. And I hope he has a bright future with Star Wars in general, seeing what he's doing, you know, with them uh, kind of hurrying and trying to get nine up and going and piece together after, you know, the last two fails. I just feel like it'd be cool going forward to bring him in more if anything you know even as just someone to discuss options with it seems like he's got it he's got it down that's what it was initially supposed to be about anyway you know so. what do you think dave give us your thoughts um yeah i, I really thought that um dallas bryce did a very outstanding job at the episode four you know, because, you know, she takes after her daddy, so. <laughs> um, Who is the director of Solo, her dad. Yeah. So. So he's part of this family as well, of all these people who, act, unlike the guy who did Last Jedi, these other creators and directors care about Star Wars. Yeah. Um, Solo was another win, you know, so. Um, like I was saying is that, uh, you know, you got Ron Howard that's been in acting and directing in television and movies since he was a kid, you know, and um, and it's nice to see him evolve as a director, you know, and from an actor to a director. So um, it was really cool to see him. I thought he did an outstanding job with Solo, you know, and I really liked that movie. I want to watch yeah. that again really soon. And, I'm uh, a big fan as well. And uh, to have um, his daughter be involved in it too, you know, that's that's an amazing feat as well. You know, her her coming from the movies that he's done from Spider-Man Three to The Help to the Jurassic World franchise. You know, she's she's been around a block here and there, and to be involved with that along with Favreau and. Uh, you know, guys like J.J. Abrams, you know, who spearheaded the Star Trek uh, reboot franchise and uh, <clears throat> him being involved in Star Wars. Uh, I don't know what the deal is with Brian Johnson and what he did with The Last Jedi because, 
he basically unraveled everything that Abrams did with the Force Awakens, and so that's what left a, a sour note or taste in a lot of fans' mouths because of that. Yeah. And it's nice to see Abrams come back, but I, I don't think that um, I don't think this last movie is going to salvage what Ryan Johnson did. Uh, from the previous one because it just kind of undid everything that The Force Awakens was supposed to be about and left. You know, there wasn't anything that was left as a cliffhanger or anything like that. But uh, aside from that, um, yeah, episode three and four was pretty exciting, especially uh, this past episode. Um, I really enjoyed that a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so like the three... Let's go to three, Kevin. Let's talk about episode three. Again. We see the Mandalorian is finally done. He has Baby Yoda. He's returning to collect the bounty. And um, he's starting to, to be more attached. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that he got involved with his fight with the mudhorn creature that he could Save not. Save his life. Own. Right. It's plain and simple. Mando was ready to die. He pulled out a sword. He wasn't giving yeah. up with a knife, but he knew he was going to die. That was it. Yeah, his viral blade. Yeah. He made, he accepted the fact that he was going to die. So, yeah, yeah, I think that connects you to anybody. If someone were to save your life like that, that's going to connect you for life. That's a huge thing. So, I think he just fell for him there. They connected and he wasn't going to let him go down. He violated every bounty rule there was, even asking questions and. <clears throat> yeah. The uh, client says how uncharacteristic yeah. for you to be interested of what we're going to do with it moving forward. We, you've been paid, and they're paying him and all this Beskar steel that they mount down for the armor. And that's, that seems to be what he's after is more Beskar and right. see him get the full suit. And it looks impressive. I mean, it looks impressive as hell. It's really awesome. Um Let's talk about the scene in the cove when there's other Mandalorians paying attention to how much Beskar he just dropped off to their leader slash the blacksmith Mando. <clears throat> yeah. Ham basically was treating him like he was betraying them, like, oh, this is, you know, dirty, basically a dirty score. And yeah. And he even, like, they even kind of got fisticuffs there. They were. Tugging and pulling knives. It looked like they were going to fight to the death almost until she told him to chill out. Yeah, she explained to him, hey, this is the way, you know, what he's doing. Yeah. He hasn't violated anything that says that he's a traitor to his tribe there. So that was interesting. And ultimately, Ham, like, behaved. He's like, okay, you're right. <laughs> Dave, give us a breakdown on the fact that this Mandalorian was up front with his leader and told her that she was going to give him the insignia for killing a mudhorn. And he told her, you can't do that because it wasn't a clean kill. I don't want credit for it. Uh, I had to help. And the person that helped me did not know that we were enemies at the time. Break down why he came up front with her and, and felt like he didn't earn that. And he did not want that represented on his arm. Well, he, he basically checked her, you know, and just like, hey, look, you know, this is what it is. This is what happened, and this is why I don't want it mm -hmm. done this way. And mm -hmm. that's what caught them off guard, and that's why they almost had that scuffle. You know, he was prepared to, you know, go head-to-head, toe-to-toe with all of them. But she realized, that's why, you know, like you mentioned earlier, that she realized, they like, look, you know, he's right. He didn't do anything wrong, but, you know, hey, this is the way. And, and that's what saved him at the end of the episode. It's because um, even though he was about to pretty much yeah. die. <laughs> we never heard of ourselves at that scene, but he literally exhausted every option he had during that firefight. But we'll get to that when that scene's there. I want to talk about before that happens. Um, Kev, he's marching back to the Razor Crest. He's going on a new, a new mission. He's already asked for another job from his handler. He wants to keep earning, wants to keep working. Um, and he's like begging him to take time off, to chill, to enjoy his, his yeah. you know, his victory. And the Mandalorian wants to go out there and, and keep earning. But uh, why could he not take off? What stopped him 
from leaving the planet. It was the, the distance between him and the child. Why, you know, why did he put himself in that position when he could <clears throat> be left and just got over it? He was trying. He was trying to force himself to do what his people believe are the right thing, that what the guild thinks, you know, rules were. He was trying to be that guy, you know, stand up and do his job. But his uh, sense of honor to, to Baby Yoda was just too strong and, and it overcome, luckily, right before he took off. Because it seemed like he was, do, he was, you know, he was questioning it, but he was fighting. There was an internal struggle within himself. I to think do what he uh, trained to do. having to put that little knob mm -hmm. back on that thing is what yeah. was the last thing. It was a powerful moment. That was a decision maker right there because that yeah. brought back the memory he had with him in the ship where he was playing with that little ball. And that was when he's like, I can't let that child succumb to whatever they're going to do. I got to do something. And he was willing to betray everybody, his tribe, the guild. He was going to betray them all to do this because this is how strong this was. You know, he was willing to give it all up. So that was pretty, pretty powerful, pivotal moment for him to just – Throw it all away after everything he's done. <clears throat> Let's talk about the infiltration of the enemy base, the client's base, that he had been there two times already. Now he was going in, this time not invited. Blucher, break down the scene of him breaking into that uh, installation to save Baby Yoda. Well, basically what had happened was he had a... Uh, um, uh, I'm having a brain fart right now. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> basically, once he had gave up the bounty to the client, and then um, when he was leaving, you know, you got to understand that he's seen them. Uh, they take the baby Yoda into an area, and then as he was leaving, he had seen all these uh, 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 troopers and everything around, and then that's what uh, captured his attention. So, you know, curiosity kills the cat so he was curious to see what was going on because he was actually when he went back to look for it he had seen the uh the little basket all damaged and and destroyed and then he was just like wait yeah. what is this? and that's what got him and then that's when you know that that connection like kevin was talking about um uh, <clears throat> you know a life for a life you know and so I think in his mind, he felt like, well, he saved me once, you know, I owe him one as well because mm -hmm. we can't see him going out like this. Because in his mind, despite what the doctor told him, uh, when he did find him in that uh, other room, mm -hmm. uh, that he thought something terrible was going to happen. And so once he went in there and shot up all the troopers and then finally right. to the room, that's when he saw him on that table all locked up and doing that scan thing and stuff. And the doctor's like, wait, 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 wait. No, no, it's not what you think. You know, we, we did, we're trying to save him, you know? Right. Right. Well, there was a probe droid on its way with a syringe, you know, and who knows? And so who knows? I mean, they could have been trying to dissect them and stuff and cut them open and, and study them and, and whatnot. We don't, we don't know what real intentions was. We don't know that, what the doctor said, you know, and he was like, we're trying to save him, you know, but in uh, Mando's mind, it was like, no, you know, I, regardless of what you say, I, I need this, you know, I need to get him out. And so he was able to get him out and take him. And that's when, uh, that's when, uh, as he was heading to the ship, that's when we get to the, the final scene, you know. Right. So that's when Cove comes to his rescue, but yeah. I want to ask Kevin, uh, why did the Mandalorian spare the scientists, you think? He could have easily capped that dude. Yeah, uh, well, I figured, you know, the stormtroopers were a threat. You could tell who the threat was. This guy was obviously not tact tactically trained as a military. You know, he was a, and he was basically, I don't know, when he was, when I heard him talking about trying to save him, he seemed really sincere. So maybe he felt like at least this guy was coming from a good place. I love all the theory based on that uh, Dr. Parrish. There's mm -hmm. a lot of uh, theory out there uh, based on like little Easter eggs of the episode, like the patch. Have you mm -hmm. read and watched a lot of that? Yeah, Apparently yeah. This patch is the same thing from uh, the clone world that he's possibly... From where they were uh, making all the Django Fett clones? Yeah, the, from Clone Wars. From Camino. Camino, yeah. That's the Camino patch that you see their, their staff and everybody wearing. It's been matched up 
and it looks like the same patch. So the theory goes that this guy is a, a clone doctor. He or he works on you know clones. So he and was a scientist created in Camino. Right. Or he worked there. You know. Mm -hmm. that was or he was one doctor. of the. He was one of the minds at Camino making clones. I got you. Right. So there's a lot of theory of whether. I don't think they, they're the theory is of you, maybe you ah. being a clone, but possibly trying to uh, take uh, metachlorians from him and clone him somehow. Or That's all the theory that's out right now, which it could be false. But the patch is very strong uh, indicator that he is related to the physicians over at uh, Camino. It's <clears> interesting, man. And we all know, based on the trailer, the newest trailer, Camino is going to play some kind of role in Rise of Skywalker. So mm -hmm. right. I love all the, the connections in this yeah. series. We need that. Movies. That's how, that's what's going to save it. If it like saves a little bit, they need to do this where it's connecting us right. older, our older watchers. We see these connections. It's going to make it interesting. That's a very good point. Take us back to the scene where he's trying to leave the city, Dave. This is the big confrontation of episode chapter three. Um, he's he's on his way out. He's got Baby Yoda in hand. He's already been through a firefight at the client's house. Now he's confronted by his bounty handler guy, the one that gives him the jobs. And break down how that played out. <clears throat> you know, basically, uh, when he went back, you know, they they actually was half of them were waiting for him. Or he was actually his uh, handler was actually waiting for him, and he's like, "Where are you going?" He's like, "Hey, you need to get out of my way." You know, I'm heading yeah. back to the ship, and then uh, he's like, "No, you're done. You know, not without the bounty. Give us the bounty, then I might let you pass." You know, think about it. And then, uh, as he was about to get ready to shoot his way out, that's when you see all the other bounties. You know, with the little uh, probe things. You know, light up and everything. They all were all. Surrounding him one by one, you know, little by little, they were all coming out. You know, in his mind, he was just like, oh, man. I was like, what's going to happen now? He's like, he's like, F it. Let's, let's do this. And so then once uh, once he, uh, once they all came out, that's when he had to set Yoda aside. And then that's when he, one by one, tried to pick them off. But it was just too much for him to overcome. And then he got nicked. And then he was trying to hide. And, he, and then his handler was like, oh, hey. You know, you brought this upon yourself, you know, you know what you're going to do. You know, just give us what we want. We might go through, you know, you still be alive, you know. Mm. And so what had happened, <clears throat> once uh, he got himself together, I think he realized and, and Baby Yoda, was they were both looking at each other. And they're just like, okay, you know, this is the end. This is, gonna, this is, this is the way it's going to be, you know. Let's do this. So as soon as he was about to uh, – uh, you know, making his last hurrah, that's when you see all these jetpacks come flying down and you see all the, the Mandalorians come in and they were all picking them off one by one and everything. And uh, so and I thought that was really cool to see all of them. And once they uh, cleared out the uh, everybody out that was that was left, and that's when they all landed in. And then they were like, yeah, this is the way, you know, and uh, right. They, Look, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna hold these guys off for you, so you go ahead and get back to your ship, right? And so then once uh, it was a pretty epic moment for sure. Yeah. And uh, and so once he was able to get back to the ship, that's when his handle was happened to be on there, and he was like, "Hey, look, you know, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to kill you, <laughs> you know." But luckily, he didn't have to kill him. You know, you know, he got the he got the worst end of it, even though he didn't die. Yeah, just, you know he got nicked. And I still feel like that man's gonna be involved in the series moving forward. I, I feel um, like uh, still also, gonna be like, a, an ally to the Mandalorian in some sense on a business way. I feel like Mando did not want to kill him either. He, no. that, he that, that was a money. that was placed. Yeah, perfect. he knew where the money was because he was already showing it off. Mm -hmm. before. So I think he shot him just to get him off off of him for now. But I don't talk think about he accuracy. Kept him alive. Yeah. So, yeah, like I said, I, I think I think he did that on purpose, you know, just to, you know, just to say, look, you know, I, yeah, because you know he's gonna need them later on, you know, because once you kill everybody, you ain't gonna have anything left to 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 rely on or to help you, you know. 
So I guess he only had to spare the people that he wanted to spare just just so he could uh, use them for later on, like an eye for an eye, you know. All right. It looks like he's trying, like Kevin has said in past videos regarding this series, this guy is trying to kill as few people as he has to because he's killed so much. So he's trying to keep it on the handle. So if there's a way he can get out of the situation without killing, he's going to look for that option. Not because he can, but for the own the toll it's taking on him, you know, doing what he does as a bounty hunter. Kind of hard. But let's transition right into the beginning of Chapter 4, Sanctuary. It's him. It's Baby Yoda. They're in the Razor Crest. Um, he's trying to find somewhere to lay low after everything that just blew over on the previous planet. Because obviously, they're going to be coming for Baby Yoda, and he knows this. And I think deep down, even the little the child itself knows that he's a target. So he needs to find somewhere to lay low. So he finds this real primitive world. It's very, very organic and earthy and not a lot of technology going on. It seemed like the perfect, you know, indoor style, you know, off the grid kind of place. <clears throat> so uh, and that's where we enter uh, Gina Carva. Uh, Whatever her name is. Yeah, Cara. Cara Dune is the name of the character. Cara Dune. Yeah. You're right. He, uh, he basically he's looking for what he even uh, what attaches him to the tribal peoples when they just make the comment in the middle of nowhere. And that's what he's shooting for to begin with. He's got to protect Baby Yoda. He's looking mm -hmm. for a place to keep him off the radar of uh, bounty hunters and, you know, if any empire is still around. So I think this attract, like you said, this attracts him. This planet attracts him to being somewhere you can fall off grid and he's got to be off grid, you know? So he does try to make this the place. Enter uh Kara's character. I thought it was an awesome character. You know, she's this basically retired battle hardened rebel trooper. <clears throat> and she shows she can more than keep up with him. Like, when yeah, was far, I was impressed with her. Ability. Yeah. That was super impressive. She was wiping the floor with this man. The hand to hand stuff between him and her was r yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. It was amazing, and uh, she puts him in his place vaguely, basically. <clears throat> and she was hardened, but, I mean, there was still a soft side to her. She was still a good person. But uh, I loved her character. I mean, it was amazing. She was looking to retire, basically, to get away from all that after a lifetime of it. So impressive. Made me want to go and get the character now. <laughs> so the, the whole point of being in this primitive off the grid world is to not have to combat. Yeah. Lay low, rest, repair the ship, do what he's got to do and not have to worry about looking over his shoulder. But trouble comes finding when you're a Mandalorian, you, you get attention. And Dave, you bring us into why the, the dwellers of this planet or this particular part of the planet where he's at anyway, are coming to him and they're trying to hire him because they are dealing with, a problem with a, a, a raging war between another faction of species on that surface that's making their way of life impossible. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> basically what had happened was uh, once he got there, you know, once he accepted the offer and he, and he, he uh, pretty much put out some terms for that he wanted in return, not only for the you know, for other things as well, and they agreed to it because, you know, it's just like, look, you know what? We need help. Uh, we don't know what to do. And you're a Mandalorian. We know what you are. So um, can you help us? And at first he was like, no, no, I'm not interested. And then they were just like, like they're like, damn it. You know, we got to walk all the way back home, you know, and so we spent all day coming to find you. Now we got to go back empty handed. And so then he was just like, you know, what? wait, hold up, you know, I I'll, I'll help you. So basically, once he uh, got there, you know, he meets he meets this woman, this widower, and uh, <clears throat> this widow, should I say, and then uh, her daughter, and um, so basically, what they were needing help was because, like Harry, like you had mentioned about this uh, other race, you know, these raiders, you know, and uh, they did come, and, and then they uh, took in the actually in the beginning of the show, should I say. They did come and they 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 raided their village, so that's why they had those two guys come and find Amando 
to out offer, you know, hey, look, you know, we need help. This is what we give you in return. So that being said, he basically she basically explains to him the situation. And so as uh, Kevin mentioned earlier, you know, during the halfway point, that's when he meets uh, Kara, uh, Kara. And so they actually team up. And at first they were just going to go there separate. Well, she wasn't interested. <clears throat> so they ended up going there to to help these uh, uh, this village. And uh, basically, once they went and sniffed out to what was uh, what they were at and what they were doing, so it looked like they were making their own, they had their own brewery, you know, to make their own beer or whatever it is that they drank, their type of alcohol. <clears throat> so, long story short, they ended up uh, finding tracks, and it was an ATS team, and they came back and they were like, "Look, this is too much for us, man. We." we we don't have that kind of firepower to stop this a- ATST. And they were about to skip town and they're like, no, 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 no. We, we, we need your help, man. We didn't, we, we paid you, you know, this is, we, we gave you what we wanted. And so basically they were like, like uh, Kara and, and, and Mando had to think fast and they're like, okay, well, maybe we can train these people how to fight. We have a short amount of time because you don't know when the next raid is going to be. And so they was able to get them together in the short term. And uh, once that had happened, uh, they had to go and um, <clears throat> distract them to get that uh, ATST out because they knew that, that they were going to use that weapon on them. So they had to make a diversion to get them to uh, uh, fall into that little pit of water that, that they had dug. You know, so once they stepped, that's when it was going to uh fall over and so once they was able to come you know they had the little fight and then the ats to kind of uh hesitated because it didn't want to go any further because it was water and so then they're like damn it's not going to move anymore so that's when mando had to uh use himself and uh kara had to uh draw that thing away from the village to use that as a distraction and once they did they was able to get that thing to move and step in that water and that's when they was able to uh knock it down and then it, and then he used his little bomb and uh blew up and that's once they lost that <laughs> the raiders just left because they knew that they wouldn't be able to uh win it or or take what they wanted because that, that atst did nothing you know it was, the, it was really well done battle, I thought. I love the uh, the uh, the background setting, you know, that kind of – we don't see that environment a- enough, not since indoor. indoor. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, 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 the writing, like, you know, their creativeness of the writers on this very much attracts us OG trilogy guys. Like you yeah. said, you got indoor, you got the wooded area seeing mm-hmm. the ATST, you know, this mm-hmm. is all very intelligently done to draw us in again. Mm-hmm. You know, so we have the Space Western. We've got imagery from our original OG trilogy. It's all well done, and I think that's what is really giving this uh, show credibility with the OG fans, you know? It doesn't get more original trilogy than an ATST, a chicken walker. Yeah. If that doesn't give you... Uh, uh, sh- you know, shades of the original trilogy. I don't know what will because those things are iconic. Iconic, yeah. Original films, so especially the battle at Endor. And I love the fact that they integrated these farmers and they knew nothing about combat other than the widow, believe it or not. And this yeah, is she's the only one. <laughs> did you guys see the complaints online about a female? Hollywood things saying there's lack of female roles in the Mandalorian and had those people before those complaints came out, had they just been patient and watched this episode, you'll see there's this, this character that's a widow and she is the best shot in the whole village. Yeah. And she's not a damsel in this type female role. Yeah. Her she, and Carr are both very strong Right. I mean, and even the director, you know, just killed it. Yeah, but you have all these organizations that if there's someone that's going to hate on something, they're going to be haters. I mean, yeah, I don't think you can stop that regardless. It's how be- misfound <laughs> is that that someone claiming that this show is anti 
female roles. I mean, yeah, you got a female director of the episode, and then yeah, you got yeah. leads that are females. You right, know, Jennifer Howard. The previous episode was uh, Deborah Chow. Deborah Chow is going to be Alexa. the director of the Obi One series that's coming to Disney Plus. <clears throat> This entire show is about this Mandalorian tribe, which is led by a female. Right. The, the heart of this show is the tribe, and it's a female that's calling the shots, basically. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know if that got bypassed. I don't know how more integrated and open to all peoples they can make it. I mean, yeah. I would, one thing I do want to touch on back on chapter three, we forgot to mention when he is presenting her with all the Beskar. And she's doing the blacksmithing and stuff. We saw some more memories of his childhood. You can clearly see that his uh, memories of, of an attack when he was a child, those were separatist robots and ships. And there's even a scene where it, I guess those are his parents putting him in a cellar type space and the door swing open. And there's one of those big clunker robots from like Attack of the Clones. Right, yeah, the bigger ones. The so ones maybe ones. that has a lot to do with his inability to trust droids. The yeah. fact that his village was raided by uh, separatists who their yeah. infantry was droid based. Probably killed his family and no telling it. But yeah, you're right. That's got to be his connection to not trusting any of them. We're getting more and more uh, and then in this one and four, the whole scene about, you know, when when will you take your helmet off to eat, you know? Yeah, only to eat. Do you guys have any thoughts on that scene about the whole <laughs> him not being allowed to remove it ever? Oh, well, yeah, actually he did, you know. Yeah, you alone he will. Yeah. But yeah. not in public. He can never show his face publicly. No. Right. That's the way. This is the way. <clears throat> he actually, for a moment... <clears throat> got to imagine himself as not having to fight you know he it was a thought he thought about taking this widow and uh having a life a normal life briefly until they made another shot at baby yoda at the end it's the only thing that ruined it for him i think he was close to deciding to hang it up clara saved his butt right there <laughs> clara saved his butt, <laughs> and he realized that he can't hang it up it's never gonna be over i was so scared for baby yoda when he had that that thing had him in his sights. Yeah. But it, it was the part that we needed to push the story on. <laughs> it yeah. had to happen. Yeah. <laughs> I think this has been a good recap of uh, chapters three and four. Uh, we will, of course, be reacting to the next one. We are halfway through this series, guys. We only have eight chapters in season one. So we're at the halfway point. How much are of you... Has this show exceeded expectations for both of you? Uh, for me, very much so. Like, I, I can't imagine a stronger showing for the pilot season. Like, it's been something, you know, like I said, again, I have people that I work with that are not Star Wars fanatics and are drawn into this story because of the, the style of it. You know, the my partner that I'm talking about is my primary partner in my other job. He is a Western guy, old school Western. That's what got him into this because he's – he likes the Duke. He likes the good, the bad. And he watches the old Westerns. And this was enough to draw him in and just fall in love with the show. So we uh, watched every single episode in one sitting again. <laughs> yeah, it's so, it's so easy to binge. I watched it three times the day it came out. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Dave, your final uh, thoughts? I mean, I, I'm blown away by it, you know. Uh, I I didn't know how this was going to be, you know, especially it being a TV series. We're so used to seeing movies and, and animated series, and but we've never gotten a live action TV series ever. Mm. Uh, I'm not including the holiday specials that you know <laughs> we got in the early '80s, but um, uh, an actual TV series, you know, it's done well for itself, you know. And um, if Disney was smart. They would uh, have John Favreau spearhead the franchise from here on out if he's up to it. You know, I mean, I know sometimes we we get burnt out on particular franchises and we want to move on to different projects. But you know, if they play their cards right with him and him being able to allow be allowed to uh, have control and 
basically what you really need to do is replace Kathleen <clears throat> Kennedy with him. Right. <laughs> That's There's a lot of say. rumors that that is like very much him, planned. You know, I think we'd be all right, you know, but yeah. um, but overall, you know, I, I really enjoy it, you know, and uh, yeah. uh, to I would like to eventually rewatch him again uh, when that time comes, you know, because I think it's a it's a it'll be fun to watch it in succession each episode, not have to wait. Yeah, here it's all when it's all watchable in one one sitting, and that'll be like a movie. Yeah, basically, yeah, that's your movie right there. <laughs> you know. But thank you guys for watching. Please like the video. Please comment below. What you think of chapter three and four? Tell us, uh, give us your opinion. We'd love any feedback we can get. We're going to call it a video on this one and we'll catch you on the next upload. Thank you guys for watching. This is Savage Podcast reacting to the Mandalorian. Peace.